Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Swayam Prabha. This is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja and I am Assistant Professor from Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. In our third session today in Law of Contracts course, we will be discussing about making of an agreement, special situations in form of tenders and auctions. Before we proceed to the subtopics we would be covering today, I would like to give you a brief overview of what we had discussed in the previous sec uh, session so that we will be carrying forward from there. The, uh, if I may just give you uh, summary points, so we had discussed about the intention, importance of intention to create legal relationship. We had discussed about the definition and essentials of a valid offer. We had proceeded thereafter to discussing the meaning that is the definition and essentials, essential rules of a valid acceptance. Thereafter, we had discussed difference between invitation to offer and offer. We had also discussed about uh, the rules, legal rules of acceptance. Thereafter, we had discussed about various types of offers and we finally concluded with the concept of e-contracts. Now herein in this session, our focus would be on tenders and auctions. There are three main topics we would be covering in this session. First is standing offer. The second is withdrawal of a tender or bid. Thirdly, conditional acceptance. In this lecture, in this session here, focus would be on certain landmark cases in order to explain the concept of standing offer, withdrawal of tender as well as conditional acceptance. To start with the concept of standing offer, it is also referred to as a continuing offer. A standing offer is one that is intended to be open for a set period of time and can be accepted at any time prior to the deadline. So an example you can see here, when a company needs a large quantity of products, from time to time, it typically advertises for tenders to supply the products. Before we proceed to the next two points, I have an example here to share with you, which is from a very renowned uh, authority on law of contracts, that is Cheshire and Feyfoot. This concept will help you in understanding the concept of standing offer and thereafter I will also uh, I will also present a simple example which will clear this concept of standing offers in offer in your mind. A corporation advertises that it may require articles of a specified description up to a maximum amount as for instance where it invites tenders for the supply during the coming year of coal not exceeding 1000 tons altogether. So we are seeing here that a company has advertised that they need, they may need this much quantity of coal that is not exceeding 1000 tons altogether. Delivery is to be made if and when demanded. Now this concept here you have to understand is of utmost importance whenever we talk about standing offer. It says if and when demanded. So Company X has come up with an advertisement in the newspaper and have called for tenders. And in that, in that tender form, in that advertisement, they have mentioned that they would be needing uh, uh, coal which would, not, which would not exceed 1000 tons altogether and they will be time and again placing an order and that order has to be met by the, uh, the person who has submitted the tender. Now, 
X is the company here who has given the advertisement and consider Y to be that person who ha whose tender has been accepted. Now, be very careful. I will explain this concept to you briefly. So, X has X has advertised about this tender. He has called for tenders. Y submitted the tender. Y has submitted the tender. Now, in the tender form, it is clearly mentioned. The quantity is mentioned and it is also mentioned that if and when the order is placed, the delivery has to be met. Now, say for example, uh, that quantity of coal is required for say a period of 3 months. So, during this period of 3 months, as and when the company will be placing the order, that order has to be met, that demand has to be fulfilled by the tenderer. Now, say for example, uh, in this 3 months time, his tender was submitted, tender has been accepted. Now, say first order is submitted on say first of uh, first of January 2024. Say out of 1000 tons, uh, they demanded for say 100 tons, right. So, this first demand, this first demand which has been made by x to y has been fulfilled. Now, consider the second, second order has been placed. So, second demand is being made on say 2nd of February 2024 of say uh, 300 tons, right. Now, what happens? Y now decides that I cannot continue with this uh, uh, thing and I will not be in a position to fulfill this particular order. So, he informs the uh, informs the authority, informs the other party, the organization who had called for tenders that he would not be in a position to fulfill this particular demand and he is uh, terminating the contract, he does not want to continue in this contract. Now, just keep this uh, example in your mind because we will be proceeding to further description, right. Now, see, first demand was made and it was met. Second demand was made and it was not met. In fact, it was refused. Now, standing offer says, series of contracts are formed based on every new order placed or demand made. That is, when a standing offer is made, a tender is submitted there is a standing offer, there is no fin final acceptance which has been made, there is no one single final contract which has come into picture. What I am trying to tell you is that standard in case of standing offer or in case of continuing offer, it is a series of contracts, every acceptance is given through the order which is placed and uh, which is and the moment it is met, right. So, let us go back to that example. First was met, the moment first order was placed, it amounted to first acceptance, right. It amounted to first acceptance. Then the first ex the demand the con first contract came into picture. Then it was met. So, first con in the series of contracts, first contract is over. Now, when the second order was placed, the second contract came into picture and contract came into picture and the tenderer refused to fulfill the demand. It amounts to breach of a contract. So, just understand this point that standing offer forms series of contracts and every time a new order is placed it amounts to fresh acceptance and a new contract coming into picture. Now, one more point I would like to highlight here. Before, say first order placed, first order met, first demand has been met, one contract complete. Now, consider that before, 
before the second order could be placed the tenderer decides to revoke the tender or say for example the uh, the company who had called for tenders decides that we now are in no more need of the coal and inform the tenderer that see we are terminating the we are terminating the contract and there is no uh, contract in existence now that can happen in a normal contract once offer is uh, given made once acceptance is given to that offer a contract comes into picture if either of the party commits breach of that contract the remedy can be claimed from the court there is a slight diff slightly different principle in standing offer because as i said series of acceptances series of contracts so moment first contract is complete that is first acceptance uh, given first contract complete now before the second order can be placed and second contract can come into picture either of the party has the right to withdraw the tender or to terminate the contract if that happens it does not amount to breach of contract and the uh, there's uh, the party does not have any either of the parties does not have a right to go to the court and say breach has taken place so be very careful about that part so if after placing the order if after placing the order the order is not met breach of contract if before the second order is placed the tender is revoked there is no breach right so that is what the concept of standing offer is let's continue with the uh, completing this example here reading this example from the screen it says uh, not exceeding 1000 tons altogether deliveries to be made if and when demanded that is what i just now explained to you the effect of the so called acceptance of the tender is very different how is it different that also i just explained to you the trader has made what is called a standing offer that is the person who has submitted the tender on look uh, after seeing the advertisement is the one who has made a standing offer until revocation he stands ready and willing to deliver coal up to 1000 tons at the agreed price when the corporation when the corporation from time to time demands a precise quantity the acceptance of the tender however does not convert the offer into a binding contract for a contract of sale implies that the buyer has agreed to accept the goods in the present case the corporation has not agreed to take 1000 tons because see they had said uh, invite tenders for the supply during the coming year of coal not exceeding 1000 tons altogether if and when demanded that means they are trying to communicate to the people to the to those people who will be uh, or you can say prospective tenderers that see we may need this much quantity of coal spread over this much time period right so are you ready are you willing to make an offer fine so that is what it says uh, standing offer will not lead to a binding contract right so in the present case the corporation has not agreed to take 1000 tons or indeed any quantity of coal it has merely stated that if that it may require supplies up to a maximum limit so this is what the entire concept of standing offer is all about standing offer can be revoked before a new demand for supply is made but if already order has been placed then no revocation is possible and non compliance of the demand may lead to breach of contract that is what i explained to you now let's see uh yes we have discussed this uh, concept of standing offer now there is this landmark case which would which will further uh help you in understanding the application of this concept you have understood the concept so it is very important in law that apart from having theoretical uh, clarity about any concept we also need to understand the application of that concept so we have till now discussed the conceptual part let's proceed to the application part of it 
the application part of it we will be explaining through the concept of to, uh, through this case law union of india versus madala thathaiya it defines tender as a formal offer to supply goods or to do any particular job and a statement of the price that you or your company will charge right so what happened in union of india versus madala thathaiya is that uh, railway corporation the railways they had uh, given an advertisement wherein they invited tenders for uh, uh, they had invited tenders for supply of jaggery to the railway grain shops the quantity of jaggery which they had uh, uh, advertised for or which they uh, had uh, uh, given in the news given in the uh, public domain was that they may need 14000 mounds of jaggery now 14000 mound if my memory serves me right one mound is roughly 37.2 kg if my memory serves me right fine so they had advertised that they may need 14000 mounds of jag jaggery within a period of a uh, few months and as and when the order will be placed the demand has to be met right but one thing is very important to note here in the tender form which they had uh, prepared there was a condition in which they had reserved a right the railway company the railways which was being governed by the uh, government of india they had reserved a right with them to cancel the contract or to terminate the contract at any stage if and when they want and uh, they would not be further responsible for any remaining the uh, remainder of the quantity of jaggery right let's see let's read what that particular condition was this administration reserves the right to cancel the contract at any stage see they are reserving with them the right to cancel the contract at any stage during the tenure of the contract which i said which i just told you was for a couple of months without calling up the outstandings on the unexpired portion of the contract that is out of 14000 mounds say if they have placed the order for uh, 3500 mounds and the order has been met uh, thereafter uh, and uh, after uh, after that 300 3500 mounds of jaggery's demand is met they now decide that we do not need any further jaggery and they terminate the contract before placing any other any further order in that situation they are just trying to say that if uh, anything is uh, remaining whatever the outstanding would be we are not going to be held responsible for that but now the punch here is that they are saying that they can reserve this right with them to cancel the contract at any stage they are not saying before placing next uh, order or anything they are just it it's like a blanket right which they have kept with themselves which they have reserved with themselves that is the right to cancel contract at any stage when they want it now now what happened there was communication between the tenderer and the railway administration so when they advertised for tenders uh, for, uh, for uh, tender call for tenders this person madala tathaiya he submitted his tender and he quoted his uh, price his tender was accepted so when his tender was accepted the railway administration wrote to him saying, saying that these are certain formalities which you have to meet thereafter we will be uh, placing our order so we were discussing the judgment of union of india versus madala thathaiya which deals with the concept of standing offer so i just had explained to you the entire concept of standing offer which is also known as continuing offer let's continue with the uh, uh, discussion on the judgment here. i'll briefly give you the facts again so what i was telling you is that the railways had uh, given an advertisement in the newspaper uh, they had given an advertisement wherein they had called for tenders for supply of 14000 mounds of jaggery jaggery means good right and uh, that was for the supply to the railway grain shops right and 
in that tender form a particular condition was present as per that condition the railways the administration they had reserved a right with themselves to terminate the contract at any time and once they terminate the contract th that condition mentioned that they will thereafter uh, be not responsible for the remaining quantity of jaggery right so this uh, person madala thathaiya here the respondent here he submitted his tender his tender was accepted the railway administration uh, made a communication they wrote to him that his tender had been accepted and there were certain formalities which he had to fulfill after which the contract will be the, the, the agreement will be executed now once an intimation once a communication was done so whatever the necessary conditions were they were met by uh, madala thathaiya now thereafter one such intimation one such communication was made by the railways to the madala thathaiya wherein in that specific letter which i am referring to two things have been highlighted what were those two things one by one i'll tell you first thing was that again emphasizing the condition that they reserve the right to terminate the contract that is they were just uh, uh, repeating that condition which they had earlier stated in the tender form the second thing which if i may say uh, changed the game was that in that letter they had highlighted four dates spread over a period of 2 3 months wherein they had mentioned that on date a we need 3500 mounds of jaggery on date b we need another 35 mounds of jaggery date c 3500 and date d 3500 so what i am trying to tell you that in this case through this letter the railways ended up placing an order placing an order in fact all the orders together and they clearly stated that during these four dates they need this much uh, quantity of jaggery now despite having placed order for the entire quantity of jaggery the railway administration terminated the contract they terminated the contract remember what i just told you i said in case of standing offer if before second order has been placed the uh, either of the party revokes or terminates a contract that is acceptable does not amount to breach but once order has been placed contract has been formed and when the contract has been formed and either of the party decides to not fulfill their obligations under the contract mind you breach is committed so here what happened the railways terminated the contract saying we had reserved this right to terminate the contract and we are exercising that right and uh, now madala thathaiya obviously he was uh, he he got in touch with the authorities and he emphasized on the point that the orders had already been placed so now at this stage the government cannot abruptly terminate the contract just like that right but he was not heard he was not heard now when the matter has gone to the court so why this judgment is important here because the supreme court of india in this judgment has said that yes the the government when they had reserved this right to terminate the contract that is fine but they had exercised this right in this situation at the time when they had already placed the orders for the entire quantity of jaggery so once that has once that has happened terminating the contract has amounted to a breach of contract right now i have uh, highlighted this judgment here you can see tata cellular versus union of india because this particular judgment gives you the definition as well as the essentials definition and essentials of a valid tender 
it says a tender is an offer it is something which invites and is communicated to notify acceptance broadly stated the following are the requisites of a valid tender it must be unconditional must be made at the proper place must conform to the terms of obligation must be made at the proper time must be made in proper form the person by whom the tender is made must be able and willing to perform his obligations there must be reasonable opportunity for inspection tender must be made to proper person it must be a full amount so there is no need to get into the details of all these uh, essentials for a tender but this is only to highlight that these are certain important th these are certain general things so which you should be aware of now difference between tender and auction we just discussed a judgment uh, madala tatayas judgment wherein we again and again refer to the concept of tender what exactly is a tender and how is it different from the concept of auction that is what we'll see now tenders are sales in which buyers submit sealed bids directly to the seller once the tender has ended the time period for uh, uh, accepting the tenders has ended the seller will select the winning bid and notify the winner so generally you will see that in case of tenders instead of bids the term used is uh, quotation right but using this terminology is also not wrong unlike auctions bidders do not view any other bids that have been placed now you must have seen that whenever there is an auction taking place people they uh, give bids they the bids they bid right they provide bids and the highest generally the highest bid is the one which is accepted right and in case of tenders the tenders are submitted in sealed form and at a particular designated date the tenders are open and as it has been written here uh, once the tender has ended the seller will select the winning bid and notify the winner right so that's why in case of auction everyone knows the bid of other person and is in a position to propose a higher bid but in case of uh, tenders you have already submitted the tenders in sealed formats and one once and for all it will be opened all the tenders will be uh, gone through and one particular tender will be selected right now in case of auction it is said that it it generally means to offer a particular amount of money for something that is for sale and compete against other people to buy it competitive bids are placed competitive bids are placed yes reason being that your i won't say opponent but you can see the other bidders they are proposing their bids and if you actually need that particular thing you may raise your bid and uh you may get that thing right now generally in an auction the highest bidder gets the property whereas in a tender the seller selects the best offer or if i may say the best quotation let's try to understand one important aspect which will actually check your understanding on the concept which we had just uh, discussed in the previous session that is invitation to offer right now i have written here that significance of invitation to offer offer and acceptance in auctions and bids so what i am trying to uh, emphasize through this point is that we have to see at what stage we are saying that an invitation to offer has been made at what stage offer has been made and at what stage an acceptance is acceptance has been made so the moment there is an advertisement or a public notice of in of call for tenders or uh, for uh, call for bids in auction that amounts to invitation to offer that is an invitation to offer because herein you are inviting people to come forward and uh, submit their tenders 
or uh, attend the auction and uh, place the bids, right? So that intimation to the public through public notice, through advertisement, anything that amounts to an invitation to offer. Invitation to offer means you are inviting offers. So now, the moment after reading about that uh, advertisement, about that particular tent, call for tenders auction, a person submits his tender or say a person goes and attends the auction and, sub and uh, proposes his bid, that amounts to an offer being made. So submitting of the tender, that is your quotation and the proposing of the bids in an auction is the second stage, that is the offer. Now once the tenders are opened and a particular tender is selected, if it is fulfilling all the requisite conditions, that amounts to and the person uh, concerned is communicated, that amounts to acceptance. Similarly, in case of auctions, you must have seen, generally in case of highest bid, the hammer goes down. So that is communication of an acceptance of that particular bid. Now coming to the second part of this session, the second important concept which we have to discuss here, that is withdrawal of tender or bid. Now I have, I have mentioned this judgment here, if you could see Rajendra Kumar Verma versus state of MP, Madhya Pradesh. So which is dealing with a very general rule of Indian Contract Act, a particular principle which has been incorporated in the Indian Contract Act that a person who makes the offer is entitled to withdraw his offer or tender before its acceptance is intimated to him, right. So I have the right to revoke. Now in this case, Rajendra Kumar Verma versus state of Madhya Pradesh, the state government, they had, uh, they had called for tenders and those tenders were dealing with uh, supply of a sale of tendu leaves, right, Sa sale of tendu leaves. Now Rajendra Kumar Verma submitted his tender and uh, he, fu he was fulfilling all the, uh, he fulfilled all the particular requirements, he submitted his tender. Now there was a particular clause which the government had provided in the tender form, let us just see what that clause was. A tenderer may be allowed to withdraw his tender of any unit of a division before the commencement of opening of tenders of that division on the condition that on opening the remaining tenders, there should be at least one valid tender complete in all respects available for consideration for that particular unit. So now the government decided that from there is a particular unit of theirs uh, from where they wanted to sell uh, tendu leaves. So they called for tender, Rajendra Kumar Verma submitted tender. Now what happened further in this case was that Rajendra Kumar Verma before the day on which all the tenders had to be opened and a decision had to be taken or a particular tender had to be selected before that designated day, Rajendra Kumar Verma informed the government that see I am revoking my tender, I am withdrawing my tender and please my tender should not be considered. Uh, when the uh, when, when the tenders would be open, the remaining tenders would be open. So he was withdrawing, he was revoking his uh, tender. But what happened? The government, the day on the day of, on the designated day, there was only and only one tender which they had received, which was Rajendra Kumar Verma's tender, and there was no other tender which they had received, which was fulfilling the requirements. It was only Rajendra Kumar Verma's tender. The government, despite the fact that he had withdrew his bid, he, he had withdrew his tender, his quotation, they communicated their acceptance to him, informing him that his tender has been accepted and he needs to fulfill the requisite formalities and execute the agreement. He wrote to them by mentioning that, see, uh, I had already revoked my offer. So there was no offer in existence when the tenders had been opened. So I am not under any obligation. But the government, while exercising one of their rights which they have reserved for them, which they had reserved for them in the tender form, 
that uh, uh, the particular security amount which he had submitted, Rajendra Kumar Varma had submitted, they forfeited that security deposit. They in fact tried to recover the loss which they had suffered because of non uh, acceptance of uh, this uh, Tendu leaves by Rajendra Kumar Varma, right. But just look at the first point here, the first rule. Person who makes an offer is entitled to withdraw before its acceptance is intimated to him. So, in this case, was there any intimation which was made to Rajendra Kumar Varma? Was any valid acceptance which had come into picture? Answer is no, because the tenders were yet to be opened and he exercised his valid right. Remember, in the first session itself, we had discussed this thing that yes, in case of contracts, duties are primarily fixed by parties, right, absolutely right. But those, those duties, those uh, terms of the contract have to be within the bounds of law. Now, the written law of our country is giving the right to the person that if you have uh, given an offer, you have made an offer before you, before there is intimation of an acceptance to you, you have the right to revoke your offer. This is exactly what Rajendra Kumar Verma did. He exercised his right which has been given to him by law. Now the government by incorporating a condition, such a condition which they are stop, in which they are stopping the other person from exercising his legal right is wrong in the eyes of law. Therefore, it was held in this judgment. It is MP Madhya Pradesh High Court's decision, a very uh, important uh, decision to understand this uh, uh, aspect that what Rajendra Kumar Verma did was right. He did that in exercise of his legal right and the government by merely providing a clause in tender notice could not take away that legal right of the petitioner, in this case Rajendra Kumar Verma. There is this one more judgment I would like to highlight. It is not specifically dealing with the withdrawal of bids or tenders, but it is dealing with an important aspect. Let us see, uh, related to tenders only, but let us see. The first respondent that is that was uh, Union of India invited tenders for execution of five items of work including supply, delivery and stacking of 75,000 cubic meter machine crusted track ballast. You must have seen on the railway tracks that uh, there are uh, the, the thing which is placed on the tracks, the stones, the machine crusted stones that is known as ballast right? and on which the track is placed. So, 75,000 cubic meter machine crusted track, uh, crushed track ballast as per specifications at its depot in Norozabad and loading it into railway wagons. So, supply was to be done, delivery was to be done, stacking was to be done and uh, loading of the track ballast into railway wagons. All these were the things which had to be done, five items of work which had to be done uh, according to the requirement of the tender. The entire supply period for the track ballast and other uh, things was 24 months, that is period of 2 years. Now, tenderer was to hold the offer open till such date as may be specified in the tender, which was for a minimum period of 90 days. It simply means that fine, the tenders are uh, submitted, but you have to wait for at least a period of 90 days you have to keep your offer on hold for at least a period of 90 days before uh, the offer is accepted or the rejection also is communicated to you. So, 90 days was the minimum period mentioned. Now, 5 tenders were received. The appellant made his tender with a covering letter that if his offer is accepted within the stipulated time, rebate would be offered. So, he said that fine, you are asking us to wait for 90 days time period, but uh, even before the tender is opened, along with this tender itself, he is submitting this letter highlighting that instead of waiting for 90 days, if you will accept my offer, my tender, within 45 days, I will offer you a further rebate of 5 percent. Then he said, if you will, instead of 45 days, of 60 days, I will offer you a rebate of 3 percent. If, say, uh, within say 75 days, I will offer you a rebate of 2 percent, right. 
so he said if you are accepting my offer before the period of 90 days i am ready to offer you a further rebate there was this other person also who had submitted his tender but he did not uh, submit any such covering letter along with his tender instead he made a similar offer you can see on the screen he made a similar offer but it was made after five days of opening of the tender tenders had already been opened so here we have one person who is uh, kanahiya lal agarwal uh, who is saying that see I have uh, submitted the tender along with it I am submitting a covering letter and I am offering further rebate to the government if they are accepting my tender before the designated period. Then here we have the second person Mr. Uh, respondent number 5 here who whose quotation mind you uh, was the lowest without any rebate as such as such uh, the tender itself was the one which was giving the lowest quotation so generally it happens that the lowest quotation if it is meeting all the criteria, is the one which is selected but what happened the the government accepted the tender of Kanaya Lal Agarwal here reason being he was offering rebate right he was offering rebate and they accepted his uh, tender now respondent number 5 approached the court he filed a petition saying that uh, my uh, quotation was the lowest how come this person is getting the benefit of it he cannot get the benefit of it and if it if it is about rebate even i had offered the rebate right now let's try to distinguish between the two situations here in this case the short question for consideration was whether the tender offered by the appellant that is kanaya lal with the rebate could have been accepted and whether such acceptance would affect the interests of any other party now in this case the respondent number 5 he had approached the court as i told you saying that his uh, quotation was the lowest and hence his tender should have been accepted accepting the tender of kanhaiya lal agarwal was a mistake committed by the government and uh, that mistake should be corrected uh, whatever work so far he has done is fine but now the tender should be given to the respondent number 5 and he should uh, do the remaining part right court observed the concession or rebate given is an additional inducement now because what had what had happened was this person respondent 5 when he approached the court the high court had given the decision in his favor saying that yes what has happened with him is wrong that his uh, quotation was the lowest and uh, he, that should have been accepted but now kanhaiya lal agarwal was the aggrieved party because the decision was against him he was the aggrieved party he straight away went to the supreme court challenging the decision of high court saying that uh, what i did by offering rebate was not a wrong step on my part in fact court observed court decided in his favor only kanhaiya lal agarwal's favor only the concession or rebate given is an additional inducement to accept the offer expeditiously to have a proper return on the investment made by the tenderer in the equipment and not keeping the labor idle for long periods which is part of commercial prudence court in fact is trying to appreciate this business efficient step which was taken up by Kanhaiya Lal Agarwal because if this person Kanhaiya Lal Agarwal if he has to wait for a longer period of time his labor is sitting idle but he has to pay his labor on daily basis his equipments are there which are not being used right so court said if he offered rebate along with his tender he did not he did nothing wrong he did not committed he did not commit any default of the conditions right it was further held that what the appellant Kanaya Lal offered was part of the tender itself while what the respondent number 5 made such offers separately and he made it much later remember days after the opening of the tender so if that rebate which Kanaya Lal had offered is taken into consideration then his quotation was more beneficial for the government that is why government accepted his uh, tender now the court held that there was nothing illegal 
or arbitrary on the part of railway administration because this was an allegation which had uh, been raised by uh, the respondent number 5 by this person the the other person that uh, the government when they had accepted the tender of Kanahiya Lal Agarwal acted in illegal manner or uh, the, their act was arbitrary in nature and despite the fact his, his quotation was lower the tender of the other person had been accepted but the court held there was nothing illegal or arbitrary on part of railway administration in accepting the offer which was made at the time of submitting the tender itself. Let us move on to the last part of our uh, session dealing with conditional acceptance. Now conditional acceptance means that there are certain terms that need to be met before the acceptance can be finalized. Students you need to understand that there is a difference between conditional acceptance and counter offer. I will come to this difference later. Let us just first go through the judgment of Haridwar Singh versus Bagun Sumbrui. Because once we have discussed this judgment, it will be uh, the concept will be more clear to you and you will be able to better appreciate the difference between conditional acceptance and counter offer. The concept of counter offer we had discussed in the previous session, we will be throwing light on it again. Now, in Haridwar Singh versus Bagun Sumbrui, there was a bamboo coop. A forest was there and uh, there was a particular portion, part of that forest wherein bamboo trees were, were uh, there, right, they were grown. Now the government, the forest uh, department of the government of Bihar, they decided to uh, call for, uh, to hold an auction basically and to give a right or license to someone to take away those bamboo trees, to severe those trees, to take away those bamboo trees from the forest part. Now, as has been written here, Forest Department of Government of Bihar advertised for settlement of the right to exploit the coop by public auction. So now this person uh, went ahead and he, uh, the appellant, he gave, he, he, he was part of that auction and he proposed a bid. Now the thing was that the bid which he proposed was of 92,000. 92,001. But the reserve price or the base price, the reserve price basically which was kept in that auction for that, uh, for those trees was, for that particular coop was 95,000. Right. Now see, 95,000 is the reserve price, but the highest bid in that auction was of 92,000 rupees, 92,001, which was given by the appellant. Now, there was a requirement, there was a, there were certain formalities uh, under the, uh, the, the requirement was that since the highest bid which came was lesser than the reserve price, which was 95,000 and also the fact that the auctioneer here, who was the divisional forest officer, he was not uh, having the authority to accept such, uh, amount, such an amount of bid, he had to inform his senior authorities and the government of the finance department of the government of Bihar about the thing. So, he informed, he wrote to the conservator of uh, the forests and he informed that see, after having held this particular auction, the bid which has been come, uh, which has come, which is the highest bid is 92,001 which is less than the reserve price. So, in case of auctions, whenever we talk about reserve price or base price, we mean that no bid which is lesser than this particular amount, the reserve price will be accepted. It has to be higher, right? But now in this case, the highest bid was 92,001, which was lower than the reserve price. Now what happened? The formalities had to be uh, taken care of and this auctioneer had the limited authority, the divisional forest officer. So, a conditional acceptance was given to the appellant that see, uh, fine, yours is the highest bid, but still we will have to wait for the highest authorities to inform and then only we can proceed ahead with the contract. Fine, the conservator of forest contacted the higher authorities. So, uh, 
so what happened while uh, the the decision was pending the decision in the sense the final acceptance was pending the appellant he wrote directly to the government he wrote basically to the government that see i am ready to pay 95000 right so earlier his highest bid was 92001 now when he is saying that the matter is being delayed final acceptance has yet not received he says that see i am ready to pay 95000 also which was your base price maybe because that is the reason that the things are getting delayed now 95000 before now 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 see first step is 92001 second is appellant writing to the uh, government that i am ready to pay 95000 now the at the third step before the government could communicate their acceptance to this person that yes okay 95000 you are ready final fine we accept your offer you get the license before the government could take any action on that uh, revised offer which he was trying to make he revoked he revoked the offer of 95000 that me and he wrote that i am sorry uh, my offer of 92001 should stand and this uh, later this bid which i had made of nine, this uh, offer which i have made of 95000 should be taken back i do not uh, wish to continue with that so what i am offering to you is what my bid was that is 92001 now what happened the government the government wrote to this person to the basically divisional forest officer they had sent him a communication divisional forest officer that see we can uh, we are accepting as 95000 rupees offer this uh, particular amount which he has which he is ready to give that telegram which the government had written to the divisional forest officer he never received that telegram he did not know about this fact that 95000 bid had been accepted now there are two things first is he did not receive the communication he was not aware of it second is and obviously therefore he was not able to communicate it to the appellant also that 95000 bid is accepted and the other thing also which has to be understood here is that he had already revoked his offer of 95000 how can the government accept it now now comes into picture this other character of mohammad yaqub Muhammad Yaqub directly uh, wrote to the government saying that I am ready to pay some one lakh uh, some thousand rupees to the government and this license, this particular license of uh, license or the right to exploit the coop should be given to him, right? Immediately the government got in touch with the with this person, the uh, divisional forest officer, and informed him that see. do not inform the appellant that we have accepted 95000 bid because we will be entering into a contract with mohammad yaqub right we will be entering into contract with mohammad yaqub now divisional forest officer said don't worry i did not receive any communication so i have not informed the appellant about anything right now the government accepted mohammad yaqub's uh offer which was of 1 lakh some thousand rupees he accepted that offer right now appellant challenged it he went to the court saying my offer had been accepted i my bid was the highest bid how come now government can accept the offer which is being made by mohammad yaqub the court said let's see there are few things which uh, you have to understand first moment you had given firstly the offer uh, which you had given there was a it was conditionally accepted it was not final acceptance which had been given to you so you cannot claim your right second 92000 this was the offer which you had made through your bid but later on you proposed to pay 95000 moment you made this counter offer 95000 you have revoked your 92001 bid that offer is no more in existence moment you made this offer of 95000 and then later on again you revoke 95000 and you are saying i am offering to pay 92001 
but now the government has the right that they can accept the offer which has been made by a person who is ready to pay higher bid right so that is what you have to understand conditional acceptance is not final acceptance it is a provisional acceptance right and it is uh, left upon decision of the final authority right so in this case the decision of the final authority was not in favor of the appellant in fact it was in favor of mohammad yaqub who was paying a higher bid right and so the government was held to be right in having given the uh, contract to mohammad yaqub thank you Hello, I am Shikha Dixit. I teach psychology, and I am with the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kanpur. Today, I am going to talk about what is social cognition. Social cognition is a research area in psychology, which explicates the various cognitive processes that people employ to understand the social world. So, essentially, it is about sense making of the social world which involves understanding other people as well as understanding oneself understanding others requires understanding their traits their internal tendencies their contextual aspects motives feelings emotions etc so as we can see uh, this is a very complex process and requires a massive amount of information processing even for small decisions for simple decisions people have to process a large amount of information the main uh, perspective or the approach which is used in social cognition is obviously the cognitive approach and which is the study of mental structures and processes the main paradigm which is used is the information processing paradigm as far as the range of topics in social con uh, cognition is concerned the range is very wide from individual level sense making to collective sense making as far as views of cognitive sense making are concerned there are three major dominant views in social cognition the naive scientist view the cognitive miser view and the motivated tactician view the naive scientist view emerged from research done in causal attribution and this refers to detailed and systematic processing of information and sense making in the social world however it is not always it is not always possible to make detailed uh, cognitive to engage in detailed cognitive processing and hence people act as cognitive misers in many situations so whenever there is lack of time and cognitive effort is less then people involve in uh, using certain strategies which which are functional yet they are like mental shortcuts so this is the cognitive miser approach however the question that comes to the fore is that which one of the two strategies is more important the answer is provided by the motivated tactician view and according to this view people can either use the naive scientist approach or the cognitive miser approach as and when required and they can switch over between the two approaches when required so these are the three major views which are utilized to understand cognitive sense making the topics that uh, co social cognition covers uh, ranges from uh, cognitive social cognition to social social cognition so topics such as causal attribution understanding of attitudes social schemas unconscious cognition about social situations the use of mental shortcuts or heuristics in decision making social uh, social identity and stereotypings 
stereotyping processes are some of the topics. In addition to this, a large number of social cognitive psychologists also understand collective sense making in terms of social representations.